Hello, welcome to another amazing interview in the Creative Entrepreneur Series. I'm your host, Bob Baker, and as always, I want to encourage you to get on the VIP email list so you don't miss any of the upcoming interviews. I've been, on average, posting one new one a week, so if you want a regular dose of inspiration, please get on the email alert list, and all you have to do is... If you're watching the video version of this, there should be a link to the site where you can sign up somewhere on the page here, whether you're watching on YouTube or my site or wherever. If you're listening to the audio podcast version, then all you have to do is go to DIYCareerManifesto.com. That's all one word. And there should be some really obvious links there where you can get on the email list. And when you do, you also get a big, fat, free sample of a book that I'm working on called The DIY career manifesto the unconventional guide to turning your talents and know-how into a profitable business so get on the list stay inspired let's keep in touch and now here's this week's amazing interview hello and welcome to another episode of the creative entrepreneur and my guest today i'm realizing really embraces both of those two words he's definitely a creative thinker and encourages creative thinking he's also an entrepreneur and encourages that in other people and i'm i'm just really excited to be talking today to dan miller hey dan how are you I'm excellent, thanks. How are you? I'm doing fantastic, and just really been looking forward uh, to speaking with you today. Just let me let me tell you a little little bit about yeah how this came to a be. Now, now I've been you know I've been a published I'm celebrating 20 years as a published author this year, and I've been uh, I think we have some mutual friends I know in Sutton Parks, and also I think Chad Jeffers, who's the guitar player that tours with Carrie Underwood. Um, I know he's a friend of yours and speaks at some of your events. And, but I've been in the music marketing world for a long time. But over, over the years, um, a number of people have said, have you heard of Dan Miller and his 48 Days you know, site? And, and, uh, and for, for a long time, I was just like, um, you know, it kind of rings a bell. I've been meaning to check him out and what he's up to, but I just I would just always go on to something else. And a few months ago, like this past spring, I finally... Someone brought it up. I said, that's it. I got to see what Dan Miller is all about. And I went to your website and was just like amazed at all the stuff that you're doing, all the books and products that you've created, events. You've got a podcast now. Um, And then synchronistically, within a a few days, that friend of ours, Sutton Park, sent an introductory email trying to, you know, introduce us to each other. I thought that I must have put out some positive vibes out into the universe, (laughs) maybe to cause that to happen. But, um... But basically, your kind of brand or what you're known for is a book, I guess, that you put out many years ago called 48 Days to the Work You Love. And when did that first version of that come out, Dan? Well, you know, I did kind of home-done versions for a couple of years, sold a couple million dollars worth of stuff I had in a three-ring binder. Then it came out as a traditional paper or trade book with Robin Holman Publishers in 2005. Yeah. Uh, I'm working on a complete revision right now that'll be released in August of 2014 as a 10-year anniversary. Oh, that wow. Very cool. Do just really, really well. But when when did that original like three-ring binder version come out? Because I'm interested in that because actually the, the book that I'm probably best known for is called the Guerrilla Music Marketing Handbook. And about 1995 or maybe 96, I that came out in a three-ring binder. That was the, that was this format for the first few years of its existence. And now it's in paperback and all that. But I was curious when yours came out in that early version. It really came out in 2001. I started doing that. I had I had it originally in a spiral bound version just went to kinko spiral bound and then i went to a three-ring binder then i went to a mega book university event put on by mark victor hansen and just blew my mind i just listened to people that were there came back and just started doing what they said to do and it was amazing Uh, this was back well you know 2003 2004 and it was when we were still figuring out a lot of things to do on the internet almost 10 years ago. But I just hit kind of a groove. Some things really came together well. I had some relationships really helped drive traffic, what I was doing. And we just rocked and rolled with that. And then then I got a publishing deal and that kind of set the stage for some other things that have come in the years since then as well. Yeah, I think that's a great lesson too, because actually one of my favorite quotes is from Theodore Roosevelt. The quote goes something like, do what you can with what you have right where you are. You know, and a lot of people would have just stopped or not taken action with their book idea until they either got a publishing deal or they were able to get it out in a perfect bound, you know, trade paperback. But 
you and I, I guess, didn't. We just put it out the best way that we could at the time. You know, it's almost like that minimal viable product, I guess, that, that the guy, that the lean startup talk say about, just getting it out there, getting feedback, making incremental improvements. Is that kind of the lesson there? Absolutely. I, I've never waited till all the lights are green or everything is perfect. Even as products that I put out, I've always introduced it first, put it out in some kind of a minimally viable fashion, and then get feedback from people, make it better, and develop it over time. And that has worked extremely well. I mean, I'm really one of these guys, and you may be as well, Bob, you know, it's ready, fire, aim. Well, <laughs> I just do something, and then I figure out how to do it better. But uh, I see a lot of people get kind of stumped where they're just waiting for everything to be perfect. You know, I, I know people who are writing books, you know, they're, they're writing a book that they've been working on for seven years. They're like, I, you got to be kidding me. Throw it away. Whatever you're writing about, it's obsolete. Throw it away and start over. So I've always just jumped in the game. Right. Yeah. I, I call it the perfection curse. You know, when you, when you just got to get it all right, all the ducks in a row, all the stars magically align. And that, that day never arrives, unfortunately, for most people. So... Um, so that's great. So, but uh, so yeah. So I, so I just kind of given a broad sketch. But what what else about your background? You know, would you like people to uh, to know? I know you have other books like No More Dreaded Mondays. Um, you also just recently put out a book with your son. Um, wisdom is it? Wisdom meets passion. Yes, that's correct. And and you've been doing a podcast. So this fill fill us in on what we need to know about Dan Miller before I kind of get into our official list of questions. So people kind of have a well rounded view of. Who you are and what you do? Well, I won't go back all the way, but I, I was raised in a farm, which I think is significant because it taught me to learn how to make things work, figure things out. So I learned a little bit about electrical and carpentry, mechanical things, and, and it's really a rich background to draw from. So many people see today are, are so narrow in their skills and the things that they can do, they don't have much to draw from. But anyway, came out of that and Figured out real quick that I wanted to do more than just throw hay bales and milk, milk cows at 5.30 in the morning. So I started reading as a way to broaden my options, got a hold of the little audio recording, The Strangest Secret, and it really became kind of a foundational principle. And we become what we think about. And I thought, you know, are there really options for me as a poor Ohio farm kid to do more, see more, be more, have more, if I just change what I think about? So that became a real significant principle for me and has served me well over the years. But went to school, went, kept going to school, to college, graduate school as a way to increase, broaden my options. Um, not that I took that as a career path, but I just wanted to learn more. And so in the learning more, I saw that the entrepreneurial process was something that was extremely appealing to me. So I am one of those from the top of my head to the tip of my toes. I've always just done things, done things that I enjoyed. Not a linear path, but a very much uh, a, a path of just finding things that were fun at the time and I do it and then find something else that was fun and move into that. And ultimately, and, and if I couldn't be a author, speaker, coach. You know, when I wouldn't recommend that to somebody when they're 18 years old. But after having accumulated some life experience, those three things kind of emerged at the top of the pile. Author, speaker, coach. And so now for the last 20 years, really that's what I've been doing and it's been just a marvelous ride. Right. And I know you mentioned The Strangest Secret, which I, I know as by Earl Nightingale. Um, and he was, I, I think that was one of the, long before the movie The Secret, this came out back in like 1950. And it was the first like best-selling like audio self-development uh, album, <laughs> right? It was. It became, it was the first one to go on and sell a million copies. So it became a platinum or whatever that is in an audio recording. And it was the very first product of the company Nightingale Conan. And I became a, a voracious student of theirs, listening to all those masters of achievement. And, and one of the things that has been kind of a, a peak experience for me, Bob, is that a couple of years ago, uh, without ever having talked to that company ever, ever even dreamed about any kind of connection, they called me and said, would you be interested in coming to Chicago and create a six-hour audio program on finding your dream job? And I, I loved working with them, but it was really kind of a crowning achievement in some ways to be put in the same category as those people who had helped shape my life so significantly. Yes, absolutely. Wow. And what was that program? So that's still offered by Nightingale Conan? Absolutely. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I just got a royalty check yesterday. <laughs> what, is that, what is that called? It's called Dream Job. Okay. Dream 
the six hour audio program through Night Gear Conan. Awesome. awesome. And, and so, actually, there's one thing, yeah, maybe you could clarify for me, because I think you serve a dual audience. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure what the percentage break, and maybe this has evolved over the years, but I think you, you, you do have information and advice that appeals to people that want to find uh, a job in a sort of a traditional role or working for someone else. But I, I know you also have a lot of, of, of information and advice for people who want to go the entrepreneurial path and work for themselves. And what, where do you see as the percentage of the dividing line between those two things? Has it changed over the years? Well, it has changed. We, we are rapidly approaching the time according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, where only 50% of the American workforce will be employees. Now, to some people, that's pretty frightening, but that doesn't mean we're going to have 50% unemployment. That's not, we aren't going there at all. Unemployment is dropping. It's a very reasonable rate right now. But it means that we're having people finding realistic work models that do not look like going to work at 8 o'clock in the morning and getting off at 5. You may not have two weeks vacation, a 401k contribution, all that. But they include things like these terms that we hear, consultant, contingency worker, independent contractor, entrepreneur, temp, freelancer, electronic immigrant. We can go on and on with terms that describe realistic work models. So I don't have any preconceived idea of where people ought to end up. Do I think that everybody ought to work toward being an entrepreneur? Absolutely not. For many people, the best option for them is a job where they're part of a team. It fits their personality, their skill set. It's absolutely the best place for them. But I think it's short-sighted at any point when you're going through a transition not to look at the full spectrum of possibilities. So if you are, have been in a job for 20 years and you lose your job, yeah, I don't think you should just polish your resume and look for another job. You should look at all those other things and then really in looking at yourself, determine what is the best fit for me and then move into that with confidence, boldness, and enthusiasm. And I guess that's why the original title of your book, you know, 40 Days of the Work You Love, is the sort of, it covers both, all the, all those possibilities, right? It's, it's the, the key is to love what you do, regardless of where the check comes from, right? Well, I, and at, at one point, that was find the job you love. That's a very critical change, because I realized a lot of people were not looking for another J-O-B, so we changed that from job to work which then cut, does cover all the possibilities. So Dan, we got a little bit, uh, or quite a lot about your background and your mindset. And so uh, one question I just always like to ask people is for the keys to their success. So looking back on your, you know, your, the route that you've taken, if you had to identify two or three key things that are responsible for your success and you know, advice you'd like to pass on uh, to others, what would that be? You know, one of the things is that my background was not something that was really appealing. So it wasn't like a generational plan where I was just going to follow in the steps, footsteps of my mom and dad. I think that's an advantage. It forced me to take a fresh look at really what I wanted to do and what fit me. So rather than seeing that as a disadvantage, I think it's an advantage. I've made a very good living in these last few years helping people who at 45 realize they're living somebody else's dream. And I see physicians, attorneys, dentists, engineers, accountants, pastors, who, because they had all the advantages, just kept going to school, and they ended up doing something that was not really good fit. So in some ways, uh, uh, some tough times at the beginning are an advantage. Another thing that's been a real big characteristic is simply accepting personal responsibility for where I am. Whether good or bad, it hasn't all been good, but it, there's never been a point where I pointed fingers at somebody else and blame somebody else. That has been one of the keys to allow me to come back quickly from those challenging times and to move forward into other areas where people say it can't be done. No, this is my ship, I'm driving this sucker, and I'm gonna take it wherever I think it can go. So that's a personal responsibility, uh, tough times, or find, having to find your own way? Were those, were those two of them? Was there a third one, or is that? There was well, third one perhaps draw from the strangest secret. We become what we think about. What we allow to go into our minds is critically important. And when I see people that just, they spend hours a day reading newspapers, listening to, to you know, talk radio, it's mostly negative, watching TV, well, it's no wonder they think the world is going down the tube because that's all we're hearing. But if you really have, want to have a better outlook, 
you got to hang around people who believe we're going in a positive direction, people who believe in positive things. So control your thinking, control what goes in your mind. We can do that through the things we listen to, the people we hang around, the books we read, and that's a tremendous opportunity. Yeah, and, and, and like you, I'm a big fan of uh, audio, and I discovered Earl Nightingale in the late 80s. I think he, he was already passed away by then, but I, I just love listening to audio books and while I drive or, walk, or take a you know, walk or jog or whatever. Um, and that's a great way to feed your mind in addition to books, hanging around people. Yeah, there's so many ways to get that positive re- reinforcement. And I'm glad you mentioned the personal responsibility. I, I, I assume you're familiar with a book that Jan, Jack Canfield uh, put out called uh, The Success Principles. And the subtitle is something like 64 ways to get from where you are to where you want to be. But the very number one principle in there was take 100% responsibility for your life. And on, I guess in some ways that can seem like, oh my God, I created this mess that I'm in, you know. Uh, and yes, you did. But if you accept that responsibility, you always also have the power to change it and to create a better future for yourself. And I guess that's the double-edged sword of that, taking that responsibility, right? double-edged sword, but the opportunity comes very quickly at the tail end of recognizing I created this mess. Yes, but you can get there. Once you get to that point, you can immediately flip the switch and say, all right, if I created this, then I also have the capability of walking out of it. So you don't have to wait on anything. You don't have to wait on the right people to be elected, the right laws to be enacted, or you know, to win the lottery. You just start with where you are, and that's an amazing opportunity. Yes, I love the success principles. I have it heavily marked up, footnoted, right here in my shelf. I could tell you're a voracious reader as well as a writer. <laughs> so Dan, let's talk about uh, challenges. You know, we've got to uh, um, face, uh, along with the good stuff that we celebrate, um, there are hurdles that every entrepreneur or business person in- encounters. So if you could identify like a business or creative challenge that you encountered and how you overcame it, and maybe a lesson that you learned, I think that would be really helpful. Okay. Well, I, I could uh, list a lot of them. I'll just pick it real quick. When I was 18 years old, I was a poor farm kid, but I had pretty good grades in school, so I got a grant to go to college. Got $1,800. Well, being an entrepreneur, even back then, at $1,800, just burning a hole in my pocket. I'm not going to just let it sit there. I thought, I can do something, triple that money, and still then pay for tuition when it comes due. I'll just do some little business ventures. So I bought some cashew machines. They were hot cashew machines, so you'd plug them in, they kept the cashews warm. And I responded to one of these ads in the back of a magazine. True to their word, they had some guy come down to place those machines for me. I think he was pretty well inebriated when he arrived and put the machines in places that I was allowed to step foot in, my dad being a little town pastor, but put them in there. Well, within 24 hours, I was getting calls from those places. You know what happens to cashews under heat if they're not turned about every 24 hours? They start to mold. Oh, no. So I was getting calls. So I went and pulled those machines out and hid them in our chicken coop on our farm. My dad, to his dying day, never knew that I had done this little deal. But there went my 1800 bucks. Every penny of it. When tuition came to you, I had to get out and hustle and raise that money again. Now, that did not mean that I decided, well, I'm never going to again risk anything. No, it just taught me about some things I needed to look for in a business. Today, we have personality profiles that people buy on our site 24 hours a day. It's essentially an electronic vending machine. It's the vending principles, but it's done in a way where I don't have to back a truck up to warehouse and then deliver something across town. I love the idea that I'm back in the game in something that costs me a lot of money and personal humiliation and shame but I just am doing it a different way. I learned from that experience and back in the game again. A few years later, and this was uh, a few years ago, I found myself in having built some a business and then some things changed, banking things changed. I did made some management changes too quickly and ended up selling a business at a public auction. I thought I'd come out okay and just go on. When all was said and done, owing the IRS and others, I owed $430,000 to people when I woke up the next morning. And I had absolutely nothing. I mean, the IRS was taking my house, my cars, everything. Well, that was a challenge. But again, it wasn't a time to point fingers and beg for somebody to come bail me out. I looked in the mirror and said, hey, dude, you know, you got us into this. How are you going to get us out of this? And just started from there. Didn't file bankruptcy. I just 
thought that if I had given my word, I ought to keep my word. And so I told people that I owed money, you know, if you sue me, I don't have anything. There's nothing there. And it was a corporation, so I could have legitimately just filed bankruptcy. But I didn't. I just started working my way out. Now, it took me a little longer than I anticipated, like all optimistic entrepreneurs. But I did. I stayed true to my word, worked my way out, just started in commission selling with no base, no guarantee, and worked my way right back into an entrepreneurial opportunity again. At that point, you know, I had some interesting options. And you asked earlier about if I encourage people to, you know, get a job or be an entrepreneur. At that point, I woke up that morning, had that $430,000 debt looking at me. I had some pretty clear options. I had a, a, my master's degree in psychology, had already been teaching as an adjunct professor at the university. I could have gotten a position, you know, paying sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000, but the math just didn't work. I could live very frugally with a wife and three children on an income like that, pay a little bit, live, live on a little bit, pay a little bit. I would never see the light of day again. So rather than just lick my wounds and tuck my tail in and do that, nope, I just got right back in the game again. I thought, how can I roll the dice, get in something that has a potential to make a lot of money? And that's what I did. And ultimately that led to you know, book deals and the kind of things that I'm doing now that would have never come on the horizon had I taken the safe path. Right. So yeah, I, th- I thought I'd heard in a previous interview where you're, yeah, the seeds of your, what you're doing now came out of, yeah, a, a sort of a, a well, what would be perceived as a desperate situation or an unfortunate situation. But it's times like those when we rise above, we gain strength and actually come out on the other side better than we would have otherwise. Right. That's, I have no regrets. I would do it exactly the same way again. I, I, I do some things to try to speed up the process because that took, again, much, much longer than what I anticipated. The IRS is merciless. <laughs> Luckily, I've never had to deal with them and knock on wood it'll stay the same so here's a question i like to ask every guest this is basically if you could go back and you know older mature dan now could go back and have a conversation with young dan and you can pick the age or the year that this happened you know what advice would you give in three different categories we'll tackle them one by one it's basically going to be what would you do the same you know that was what those were good traits do that a again what would you avoid and then what would you maybe do earlier that you didn't realize early on that you, you know, should have added that into the mix? So let's start with uh, what, would, what did you do right? What would you, just, would you do the exact same way? Well, the, the idea that this is my decision, my choices are going to determine my future, that is a principle that I would do exactly the same. Just believing that was, gave me an advantage in those early years I've never wavered from that. I would do that exactly the same. This is my choice. My choices determine where I'm going. And what, what is that sense of, and I guess you kind of addressed it a bit, finding mentors and reading and filling your, you know, your mind with positive things. Where is that? I know a lot of people lack that confidence and they, they're overcome with fear. And, you know, how, how did you overcome that? Or what advice would you have for people that are being held back by those, those fearful things? Sometimes I know that it, it has to do with how we're wired in our personality. And I'm, again, somebody that can jump off a cliff and hope that a net appears. Some, right? I know that not everybody is wired the same. But I see people who are crippled by procrastination and indecision. And even in those areas, and I'm not an ex- extreme in those areas. I, well, maybe I am. Other people may see that I am. But... Even like there, to make major decisions, I decided years ago I would give myself two weeks. Two weeks is an adequate time period in which to assess where I am, get the advice and opinion of other people, identify four or five possible solutions, do a little bit more research, choose the best one and act. Now that has to do with whether it's where I'm gonna send a a child to college, what kind of car to buy, what house we're gonna buy, where we're gonna go to church, what kind of business to start, what job to take, anything, two weeks. That is just one of those principles that I established as a guideline to help me so that I wouldn't get trapped in my own procrastination and indecision. And I think that's something that anybody can do. Now, I don't know what the time frame is, what it's right for everybody else, but I think if you find yourself being indecisive, do something to break that pattern and move forward. And that's been a real help to me to 
experiment with and move into new and exciting opportunities. Yeah, I love that. I love that. The, the two week deadline. Give yours, even though, yeah, a lot of people uh, will, will step up and act if someone else is imposing a deadline on them, like a boss or somebody. But, uh, but you have to, I guess, impose those deadlines on yourself and, and live up to your own expectations. And I, I love that. Two weeks to make a decision and move forward. Um, so what would you do, yeah, what would you avoid or what things, what were the, some of the mistakes that you would tell young Dan, uh, don't bother with these things, they're time wasters? Well, the idea that, oh, this, this is kind of tough because uh, I'm a pretty firm believer in bootstrapping businesses. I'm, I'm getting ready to propose a book to my publisher on studying Amish businesses. And one of the things that makes them so successful is they avoid debt. They bootstrap. I mean, they'll build a little building on an acre property somewhere out in the woods, live in half of it, and start their business in the other half. And then I see these kids, you know, coming out of school. They want a half million dollar mortgage and a Mercedes in the driveway, and then they go downtown and lease a space, five grand a month, and they're killing their opportunity. They're killing their chance for really understanding what a business is all about. So I, I'm say start small, bootstrap it. Don't be afraid to risk, but. Be careful about overextending in ways that are an unrealistic stretch on a new business. I kind of like that mistake that you made with the vending, with the cashews. <laughs> I guess putting all your eggs in one basket and, right. and, and, and gambling. That's that's great advice. And then, um, yeah, is there something that you know that you would have uh, you realized later that boy, I should have done this? You know, like publishing a book. A lot of people go. Well, the main thing I heard is not oh, I could have waited another ten years. It's like I wish I would have done this earlier. But anything like that that you would advise do this earlier don't put it off now one of the principles and i was doing this but i didn't really categorize it till later in life but that is recognize the power of linking arms with other people don't expect to do everything yourself even if you want to be an entrepreneur and i tell people in a business like we have here there are probably 20 25 different things that need to be done i probably do two or three of those pretty well that's where i want to spend my time I find people whose skills supersede mine in those other areas. They're doing things they enjoy that I don't enjoy. I let them do that. And I've done that in a way I have no employees. A lot of people immediately think, well, that's fine. You know, you got 30 people working for you. No, I have zero employees. Everybody who works for me, it's structured in a way that simply pays them for results that are produced. And it emphasizes that gives them a chance to use their best skills. But that, that is a principle I would encourage people to do earlier than I did. I thought as an entrepreneur, I could do everything, do a little bit of everything. No, even as an entrepreneur, you're much better off to define what is it that you do really well, find your sweet spot, spend 95% of your time there and surround yourself with people who fill the gaps. Yeah, that, that's a consistent thing that I've been hearing from most of the interviews that I've, that I've done. And it's, it's like a lesson that I need to learn a little bit more too. And, and just to, let me ask, what are those two or three things that you have identified are your strengths, your, you know, your sweet spot where you excel? I think I know a couple of them from listening to your podcast, but go ahead and share. What well, I, I write, think, create content. I do not do financial management. I don't do people management. I don't handle details, you know, for registration for our events. I don't want to have to deal with who the caterer's going to be. I mean, all those things to me, and there are other people who do that really well. But, I mean, I, I, I've got all kinds of computers set in front of me here. I can go into programs and figure out how to design a cover. There is no way in the world I would do that. So much talent out there that we can tap into easily for that. So designing and making sure our newsletter gets out, coordinating our websites. I don't do any of those things. I just have the luxury of thinking, writing, creating content. Wonderful, wonderful. And, and it's great for everybody to identify what those things are for, for them and, and, and it structure your life and your business so you focus on them. So Dan, you and I are both authors, but as authors, I know we are also readers and admirers of, of books and other authors. So I always love, love to ask, uh, and I get, get the most amazing answers from this simple question, but name a book that changed your life and uh, explain why. Well, uh, let, me, let me kind of coattail on what I talked about earlier. The little audio, The Strangest Secret, was probably the most profound message that impacted my life. That has become a book now. It wasn't then. It was just audio, but it is a little gift book now. 
We have them here at 48 Days. We give them out as gifts. Love that little book. But there have been a lot of other books during the years that have really helped me in my path. Jack Canfield's book, The Success Principles, that you mentioned, is a profound one because it's a compilation of so many success principles from over the years. A more recent one that I really like and recommend is Darren Hardy's book, The Compound Effect. Darren is publisher of Success Magazine, but The Compound Effect talks about that success doesn't happen overnight, but it's, this, it's the eventual culmination of the little decisions that we make along the way. So everything counts. Whether good or bad, everything counts. And the compound effect then determines where we end up. And I think that's a delightful book with a really important principle. Awesome. And I, I have all of those except that I've heard of the compound effect and subscribed to, to success, but I don't have yet yeah, Darren's book yet, but I'm definitely, it sounds like one I need to get. And I'll link to all of these, probably to their Amazon page or whatever in the show notes on the page there. So that's, that's awesome. We got three books out of <laughs> that changed your life. Uh, and so, yeah, this is a question I sort of added, and I realize it's a really important one. Sometimes we cover it in some of the earlier questions, but um, but I like what what truly motivates you to do what you do. I think this is a really key thing for every entrepreneur to to be able to answer this question. And I, I'm, I'm curious how you would how you would answer that. What's your what's your ultimate motivation? Your big why that you do all this stuff and you have been for all these years, Dan. It, I've been able to, to refine it over the years, but it really is seeing a transformation in somebody's life in 48 days. Now, that may be in their health. It may be their theological beliefs. It may be the work that they're doing. It may be to discover their purpose, their calling, their mission, their destiny for the first time in their life, even at a later age. But to see that, I mean, a lot of people are, are going through life with their headlights turned off. You know, they're just doing what's right immediately in front of them. No sense of where they're going to be five or ten years down the road. No sense of vision. They're just going through their own version of Groundhog Day. And to, to play even some small part in any way, whether it's through writing, speaking, or personal coaching, or having somebody attend one of my seminars or workshops, boy, that that's an amazingly rewarding experience. And that continues to motivate me every day. Who can I, who am I going to contact today? I mean, I just had the mailman had to deliver a package in here a little bit ago. It was a ball that somebody sent me. And it was, you can send a ball. And he actually wrote a thank you note on there. It was somebody I did a podcast with. And he wrote a thank you note on the ball. And the mailman had to bring it in. The mailman, I mean, immediately launched into, how can I help him find his purpose, do something other than what he's been doing all these years? I love that opportunity. Never get tired of it. Right. Yeah. And I and I think this is a, a, a human need that uh, I mean, that, I mean, a lot of people, again, are kind of asleep to that thinking they just they're just stuck in whatever rut that they're they're in. But I think more and more people are realizing there's a greater calling. There's, you know, there's something that they, they could be doing that serves more. And it's, and it's you know, we talk a lot about um, people talk a lot about doing something that they're passionate about and self-satisfying. But really, the ultimate, I think, um, life and work life is doing something that not only helps you make a living, but makes a difference. It's how you serve others in that process of doing what you love and earning a living. And I think more and more people are waking up to that, but that's the key, really. It's not just to sell. I mean, I think maybe initially when somebody gets involved in a creative or, or some kind of endeavor, it's self-satisfaction, but ultimately you've got to turn that around and how it serves others, right? You do. It, it's pretty weak. It's pretty short-sighted and only a temporary satisfaction if it's just simply for yourself. You know, there has to be that. Without getting you know, too expansive and broad, everybody gets to that point. What am I doing to make? And, and the cool thing is we see Gen X and Gen Y get there very, very quickly. It used to be that we thought we'd work 35 years, get a gold watch, and then in our retirement, then we'll do something to give back, something noble, something humanitarian. Well, now we see 23-year-olds who come right out of the gate. That's all they care about. They want to do something that's going to change the world, make the world a better place. And I think that's pretty cool to watch. That's awesome. There's hope for the future. Absolutely. Um, it's so uh, awesome. That was a great answer. And so how about uh, future plans? I mean, you know, you've had a lot of success in doing so many different things. Um, but what's, what's in store for the future, Dan? And I know one thing I, I noticed about you that I think is really intriguing, too, is that you like to mix things up. Like with your, like you'll just come up with an idea for something and say, let's go ahead and try that. And maybe you'll do it once or twice or for a year, like, like some of the concepts for your workshops. Is that, is that a consistent theme 
with you with you two changing? I mean, there's some consistencies, like the 48 days to the work you love, and uh, but circulating around that is always this swirling variety of activities, right? Well, it, it is. Well, you just you just kind of touched on a whole bunch of things there that are that I think are really important. I am a change agent. I'm a change junkie. I love change. Twice in my life, I have built businesses and kept them too long. Not because the business changed, I just got bored and I started to self-sabotage. Once I recognized that about myself, and it took me too long to recognize, I mean, my wife today calls me a three-year man. That's about it for me to be interested in something. So I build in change. One of the ways I do that is by November 15th of every year, I have my goals set for the upcoming year. As part of that process, I identify what is the 15% of what I've been doing that I'm going to discontinue. And I ruthlessly cross that out, even if it's something that's been fulfilling and profitable, I identify what is the 15% that I'm going to no longer do. Because I don't want to build a business that just grows horizontally. I want to stay very streamlined, clean, entrepreneurial. So by doing that, by then eliminating 15%, I can add a new 15%. And it's in that adding a new 15% that I've experimented with the big ideas that have had big payoff for me in the last few years. And if you understand compound in, uh, compound effect, really, if I do that 15%, that means every four years I got a brand new business. Now, there are some components that will stay the same, that carry over, but I'm always looking for how can I change? We did a writer's conference. You know, for, for authors who want to leverage that and turn it into significant income. We did that for four years, sold out every event we ever did. And then I look up one day, and with all the changes in publishing in the last couple of years, everybody's an expert on getting published. Everybody's doing workshops on getting your writing out there. And I thought, well, it's time to change this up. So we morphed that into an event that we call Innovate, where we invite not only authors, but anybody who's got a creative skill that they're having trouble getting in the game. If it's a sculptor, an artist, a musician, whatever it happens, comedian, we bring them here. We've only had one. We're getting ready to have another one next month. And I mean, the first one was outrageous. The response to it, it was amazing. So I'm always looking for, yeah, how can I change things and do something more exciting? Keep the status quo, no matter how successful it is, bores me to tears. I love that. I love that a, a approach. And, and I know the, the mistake that I and I know a lot of other people make is they come up with new ideas to keep things fresh, but they add it on top of the, what they're already doing without taking anything away. And then you're just overwhelmed and everything gets kind of shortchanged. And so uh, I think I might have to incorporate this idea into my own business here to, to just have some common sense about it. But I love it. So, Dan, this has been awesome. I knew it would be. You're just an, an inspiration. So where can people find out about you? And I know there's some things that we didn't even talk about, like your like your podcast and you've got this like free community um, on your site. But just ex- ex- give us a website and then tell us some of the other fun things that they can find there and you know, plug an event or whatever that you've got upcoming and go for it. Well, you know, there's been kind of a, a progression of things that I've done to expand my audience, to get the message out there. The material that is in 48 Days to the Work You Love started initially as a Sunday school class. I never had any intention of turning that into a business. I was a busy guy. You know, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm here to do it. But I started that just as a way to kind of be connected and to do something as a volunteer. Well, it, it just seemed to be a magnet. We started having people come there from other churches, and I realized well, that, that's not a good idea, so we changed it from a Sunday school class time to a Monday night. Did that for eight years, but we would usually have 70, 80 people come to that. Then I had a chance to get on radio, had an invitation. They called me and asked me if I'd be interested in doing a show. So I got on radio, was on radio for six years on a 100,000-watt station out of Nashville here, WTN, talk radio, and our audience grew dramatically. You know, So we went from those 70 to 80 people they told us in any 15-minute segment, we would have seven to 800 people. They thought that was really good, you know, listening. Then I started experimenting with this thing called a podcast back in the early days where I started putting up just little segments of my radio show, and I was blown away by what happened instantly. We were hearing from people from Ethiopia and Brazil and New Zealand and Norway and Sweden and Germany, and I told a radio station, and I'm done. I'm out of here. And they're like, what are you talking about? you got the most popular show on the weekends on our big station. I said, hey, 
technology just opened up a new opportunity. I am out of here. I finished the contract, went to podcasting, and in podcasting, we immediately went to numbers where, you know, now we have, they tell me, 80, 90,000 90, people listening to my podcast every time I do it. Wow. I'm not married to any technology. If you show me something that will give me that kind of a multiple to get an audience, I'm there. But we just keep looking at what's available. How can we expand our message? And that's been an amazing journey to just see those new things. So now we, we still have newsletter, a newsletter that goes out, and those newsletter readers say, don't take it away from us. And what we discovered is that with newsletter, blog, podcast, other things we do, those are different audiences. That's not the same people who are just fans and listen any way they can. They're different audiences. And it's made me really respect giving people information in a way that they want it. And that has been one of the most powerful things in our marketing is repurposing content, but letting people get it any way, anytime, anywhere they want it. Right, and the, yep. the, the newsletter you reference is an email newsletter, right? I, st I started in 2000, of, uh, August of 2000, so we're almost 13 years. I started with 67 email names that I had. Now, even though that's kind of plateaued because we've got some other formats that have really exploded, but we've had over 130,000 people that have signed up for that newsletter. Wow. And at <laughs> time. And it's been a real foundational piece to then build us to other things like the blogging and podcasts that we're doing now. Our live events are a blast, but one of the things you did mention there, we have a social networking community. We started four years ago, 48days.net. Now, 48days.com is where people find resources and products and all the traditional things in a business. 48days.net is a free site for people to join, but they have to join, and we, we do not accept about 30% of the people who put in an application for that. We want it to be people who are serious about living a life of their dreams and who are willing to take responsibility and do the things to put legs on their dreams. But that's a community now that's over 13,000 strong. And these are people who willingly, actively help each other. We really believe in that old adage, a rising tide raises all ships. And we've seen that played out so dramatically in this community an audience there now of 13,000, that opens up some interesting new possibilities. And those things are, you know, on, on the horizon in the very near future. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And I, and I, and I actually, I, I need to, to, uh, to, uh, apply and hopefully get accepted into the, into the community there. But I understand there are different forums and like different people take on the role of, of leading particular topics. You know, I guess as a music person and an art person, a speaker, uh, uh, I think has a, a, a forum. So there are sort of different communities within the community, right? There are 127 different groups in that community. Those are people who just volunteered and said, I want to lead this group. And so they coordinate the conversations, the activities, they meet together, they have events. And there are some people who have done extremely well in their own business under that umbrella of 48days.net by simply leading a group in an area where they had a strong interest. That's awesome. And you mentioned the Innovate, um, which I know you play with the words 48, I think, somewhere in there. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it was, is it pr pronounced the Innovate uh, event, or what, what is it called? It is Innovate. Yeah, we did a little fun thing with having 48 at the end of that word. So it reads Innovate, but we have our own brand in there in a really cool way. You can go to Innovate 2013 and go directly to that site. But that's an event. The next one is coming up September 4th and 5th. And in that, we'll have people like Chad Jeffers, who you mentioned, who's a guitarist with Terry Underwood. He'll be here. Michael Hyatt will be one of the presenters. Scott Stearman, who is an internationally known sculptor, will be here. And in the two days of that event, he's going to release from a big three-foot block of clay a totally original 48 Days Eagle in that time period. My wife and Dorsey McHugh, who's an artist, are going to be doing a segment on how to find your creativity and tap into that. But we just, we always try new things. The first time we had that, I didn't know if people would show up or if they'd care. We sold it out way in advance as we have this one as well. And it seems that we just uh, give people an opportunity to get together again, share. It doesn't all come from me, but we have a lot of fun putting these events together that kind of keep us on a cutting edge of where people are thinking, how they can actually take their dreams and do something with them. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. You're doing some fantastic stuff there, Dan. And I just, yeah, I really uh, appreciate uh, well, the work that you do and you taking the time to, to be one of my uh, early 
guests here. Uh, and so I hope to I hope that we can meet face to face sometime when I'm down in the Nashville area. I know you're in Franklin, which is just south of Nashville, and you actually hold these workshops on your property there. And you, you like convert a barn or something into a workshop facility, I think. We did. Yeah, bought a piece of property behind us and had this old barn on it. We did a light transformation on it to turn it into our sanctuary where we have live events and guest quarters. My office is there, but it, it's a really fun place to hang out. But we find that people really are drawn to it because it's a chance to be away from concrete and asphalt. So it's much different than going to a, a hotel conference center. Right. And, I, and, the, and the commute for you isn't bad either. <laughs> and we, people uh, take their turn on a zip line and pick mulberries when they're in season and see my grandkids playing. So we want to make it a memorable event, have a lot of fun doing it. Well, that's awesome. Again, Dan, thanks for your time. Really appreciate you uh, being a guest. Again, people can go to 48days.com for your main website and then 48days.net for the uh, community where they can apply uh, to, uh, to uh, join in, all the fun folks there. So thanks again for your time, Dan. I appreciate it. Hey, I'm honored to be your guest. Uh, you're doing a great work, Bob. I'll be delighted to meet you when you get a chance to come to Nashville. So let me know and we'll connect. Absolutely will do. So that does it for this interview. Thanks a lot. And I'll be back next week with another interview with an amazing person like Dan, but different. (laughs) Okay, so long for now.